Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, systems neuroscience and um, how it might be used to help us build AGI. And really, my talk split into sort of two parts. So firstly, um, I'm going to make the case for why I think that systems neuroscience um, might have an important role to play. And then um, I'm going to sort of talk about, you know, AGI, as we know, is in, in an incredibly hard problem. Um, and reaching human level AGI, even by the most optimistic um, kind of estimates, is probably a 20 year plus project. So what kind of interim goals um, might we expect to see on the path towards um, AGI? And, um, and sort of, you know, related question is how can we know, um, how can we measure whether we're making progress um, towards this path? Um, and, you know, what, what, what is it we can do um, to, to kind of aid that? So before I talk about systems neuroscience specifically um, as an approach to AGI, um, I'm going to take a sort of top level view of the spectrum of approaches taken in the past and present, actually, um, towards building AI. So at the very top level, the top level kind of distinction um, I would say is between non-biological approaches and biological approaches. And in fact, um, the non-biological approach was taken first um, and really is what is being referred to by other speakers as um, good, good old-fashioned AI. And really what that means is um, the kind of symbolic AI approaches of the 70s, 80s and 90s, um, which include things like formal logic systems, logic networks, lambda calculus, expert systems. Um, so the whole range of techniques were tried and they're all kind of mathematically or logically based, uh, kind of grounded. And what they, the general problem with all of these systems and why they didn't sort of yield AGI um, was they tended to suffer from one or more of these problems. Um, they tended to be brittle, um, didn't deal very well with ambiguity or uncertainty. They were time consuming to train or perhaps in, in light of Moshe's talk, we could talk about needing um, huge amounts of, of data. Um, they're pretty poor at generalizing. It was difficult f for these symbolic systems to acquire new symbols, um, to generate new symbols that it didn't already know. And actually, Ben's already talked about um, earlier uh, some of these classic problems like the symbol grounding problem, where if you have a system that's just describing, um, it's just describing entities with other symbols, how do you um, actually refer to things uh, outside of itself, outside of the agent? So really, this was taken to its extreme in um, the site project, which was uh, led by Doug Lennett. And is, is. sorry, is even yes, <laughs> I should say <laughs> it's true, true ongoing site project um, where really you know this was taken to its limit. Where um, I think Lennett sort of proposed that the real problem with these symbolic AI systems was not with the approach, but the fact that there wasn't actually enough information in these databases. So he went about trying to solve this by um, attempting to put um, every piece of common sense knowledge and you know, how he defines that um, into a one massive database, the site database. Um, and as Moshe points out, it's still ongoing um, 25 years later and still no sign of um, any intelligence. So um, on, the other, on the other kind of side uh, is, are the biologically inspired approaches and really, this kind of makes some kind of intuitive sense because um, there are 6.8 billion or however many humans there are alive now, you know, examples of AGI systems out there, um, which is the brain. And so it kind of seems to make intuitive sense that maybe we should be thinking about using the brain as a blueprint. Um, but even on this side of the divide, this actually covers a very large range of um, quite different approaches. Now, we can argue um, about which of these two um, approaches makes most sense. But actually thinking about this, I think what this really boils down to is um, really your personal intuition about what the search space of, of um, possible intelligences looks like. So on the one hand, um, if we think about the search space of possible AGI solutions, we could be in um, a regime where um, the search space is quite small and the number of possible, there are a large number of possible solutions. So it's a dense search space. So pictorially, this, might, this cartoon kind of illustrates that. So if the um, outer circle is a, a container is the search space, um, the entire search space, and the stars are possible AGI solutions. Um, and then the human brain, you know, in this kind of scenario is not that special. 
um, and perhaps it isn't worth the time um, and effort and resources to, um, to take and to understand um, how the brain solves these problems. On the other hand, we could be in um, a regime two, which is a relatively large search space um, that has relatively sparse number of solutions. So we might be in this kind of regime. Um, and in this case, it would seem to make sense that um, we should pay attention to um, the human brain and, and spend effort into understanding how it solves some of the harder problems rather than just um, approaching some other way of searching this uh, very large search space. So which regime are we in? I mean, it seems to me, um, you know, so there's regime one, small and dense, or regime two, large and sparse. And there seems to be two pieces of evidence, I think, that points towards the fact that we're actually in regime two. Um, one is a natural kind of argument, which is that um, evolution has only produced human level intelligence once um, after, you know, billions of years of trying. And uh, probably more pertinently, one of the, the big things that the, the, the projects in the 80s and 90s showed is that Intelligence is a very, very hard problem and was severely underestimated, I guess, in, in, in the 60s and 70s. And um, they've largely, although they've, they've re yielded res interesting results, um, and in some cases very interesting applications, they've largely failed to, work to make progress towards the overall goal of um, AGI. So then, so if we take, if we kind of, for the moment, buy this argument that a biological approach to AGI um, makes some sense, then... We, need to, we can subdivide this further um, into different categories. So here's a kind of um, spectrum of biological approaches from, on the, on the left-hand side, the most abstract, i.e. least tied to the biology, and on the right, um, the most biological. And I'm going to um, position various well-known um, projects and approaches on this scale. So I think over here on the left-hand side, the most abstract and kind of least, most loosely based on um, how the brain does things, is um, what's called the cognitive science architectures. And I could have listed actually dozens of possible um, examples of projects here, and I've just listed three of the more well-known ones here. There's SOAR, um, which is Alan Ewell's project, and John Lebs, um, Akhtar Anderson, which is from John Anderson, and more recently Ben Goetzel's OpenCog. And what these mostly have in common is effectively you can, you can display them or think of them as box and wire diagrams where, and this is actually um, a diagram of ACTAR, and what you see here is the boxes represent uh, modules very loosely based on kind of brain regions or brain processes um, that are just wired up together um, to overall create what's hopefully some kind of intelligence. Now, the main reason why I think there are so many actual approaches on this front um, is that, generally speaking, um, these are based on effectively introspective processes on the parts of the designers of these systems. There isn't, and, and that's what I think kind of makes them a little bit unsatisfactory, is um, on, in general, there aren't deep underlying principles as to why an architecture is being designed in this specific way. And you can see that cropping up um, now and again when psychology um, seems to produce some new module, let's say episodic memory. Um, we realize, you know, 20 years ago, that's an important uh, module in the brain. Um, and then all of these architectures have to sort of retrofit that into their existing kind of um, uh, wire diagram. So it feels like a bit of an unsatisfactory, unprincipled approach to AGI. And on the other hand, we have the very biological approaches. So over here, I'd put um, things like Blue Brain and, uh, and Moda's Synapse projects. And really, can, we can think of this as um, uh, close, akin to the whole brain emulation camp. And what this camp proposes to do is really look at copying or, or mimicking the brain to a very fine grain detail. So here, actually, I'm showing a beautiful diagram from one of Moda's recent papers um, showing the wiring of a macaque uh, monkey brain. And these are all the main pathways in, in the macaque monkey brain. Now, the problem I have with this approach is that, um, you know, this is a beautiful diagram and it has a lot of uses in, in biology, but how much is this wiring diagram really telling us about processes or the functions, um, the, the, the underlying functions the brain is supporting? The other issue I have with um, these kind of whole brain emulation approaches is that they rely on um, very 
uh, intricate imaging techniques. And I think that um, to, get, to get down to the level of detail we're going to need to do something like whole brain emulation, um, and what level of detail we go down to is an open question. Is synapses enough? Do we need to go to calcium channels? Um, the atomic level, what level do we stop at? Um, is, is actually that our imaging techniques are we're still decades away from having that kind of sophisticated imaging techniques, especially if we want to keep the original brain or the original copy um, intact. <coughs> So what I'm suggesting here is actually there's a sweet spot in the middle, which um, I'm calling the systems neuroscience approach. And where we're neither sort of, um, what we're really interested in is, is the algorithms the brain's implementing. So not the specific implementation details, but the algorithms and representations. And what this can map onto is um, David Mars, uh, who was the kind of founding father of computational neuroscience, um, his three levels of analysis. He did in a classic, he outlined in a classic paper in the 70s. And what he suggested is that to fully understand any complex biological system, for example, the brain, we need to understand it simultaneously at three different levels. So there's the computational level at the highest level, algorithmic and implementation level. These are the three levels he called them. Now, the computational level is really um, the what. So the goals of the system, what is the system trying to do? The algorithmic level is the how, so the representations and the algorithms, how it achieves those goals. And then finally, the implementation details, so the medium, the substrate, the physical realization of the system. Now, if we now compare these levels of, of analyses um, that Mars suggested with that spectrum I showed you in the previous slide, then we see they map on quite well. So the whole brain emulation camp would be really focused on the implementation level. Um, how does a system uh, physically do carry out um, intelligence? On the other hand, the cognitive scientist um, architecture approaches are really at more at the computational level. And therefore, what we propose, you know, what we're talking about focusing on here is really this in-between level, the algorithmic level, the how, the representations and the algorithms. Now, that would all be very well saying that we should use systems neuroscience um, as an aid, uh, as a source of inspiration for AGI ideas, but that would have been kind of a moot point till around um, 10 years ago, or maybe you could say 15 years ago, where um, really cognitive, science, uh, cognitive neuroscience has rapidly taken off. So in the last sort of 15 years, and especially the last 10, there's been a revolution in cognitive neuroscience. And I'll just show you a couple of graphs here. I don't have a, a, a laser pointer, but... Um, here, uh, this top graph here is actually a graph of um, number of citations te in tens of thousands of papers um, against the year. And you can see that around 1995, there's virtually none. And then and here we go, we're up to sort of like 100,000 now in 2008. Um, and also, it's not only exponential in total, um, the newer technologies, which are represented by the blue, red, and green. So green uh, represents um, fMRI technology, which is the latest one. Red is, is PET and blue is MEG, which is the oldest technology, EEG, um, you can see that the proportion of the newer technology is growing at the same time as the total. So there's been a massive revolution in, in um, cognitive neuroscience, and there are really new experimental techniques coming online every year. So um, recently we've had optogenetics, where you can actually... Um, uh, have cells firing when you shine a laser on them, uh, TMS, where you can actually disable, um, non-invasively disable a part of the brain, a human brain, um, two-photon microscopy, all sorts of things. And on top of that, um, compounding these new tech, uh, these kind of advantages of the new techniques have been new analysis tools. So um, multi, from, from taken from the machine learning world. So for example, multivariate pattern analysis um, and support vector machines, all kinds of uh, latest machine learning uh, technology. And all this wrapped in together has resulted in a kind of exponential growth in understanding about what the brain does. I mean, we're by no means all the way there. We're not even probably, you know, a tenth of the way there. But it's the, the, our understanding is rapidly growing. And really, what I'd like to suggest is that if we're really interested in, in, in moving forward with AGI as fast as possible, and we believe in this systems neuroscience approach as being a useful uh, 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 side approach, then we should be not just passively observing what the neuroscience field is doing, but we should be actively conducting neuroscience research that might be useful for AGI questions we may have, which of course is not necessarily um, what's driving the majority of the neuroscience research. Okay, so 
I've argued that, um, you know, I believe that, that neuroscience is likely to have a big role to play in, in building AGI. Um, now, what specifically do I think it can bring to the table? Well, if you view neuro, uh, system neuroscience as a kind of orthogonal source of information as compared to pure machine learning and mathematical techniques, then I think it provides two things. Um, firstly, it can provide direction. So here, by direction, I mean inspiration for new types of algorithms and architectures. So I could have, I could have come up with several different examples, but the two um, pretty well-known ones are object recognition systems um, such as uh, Tommaso Poggio's MIT's HMAC system, which are basically hierarchical neural networks inspired by the, the um, primate visual system. And then there have um, been navigation systems um, that have been inspired by hippocampal place cells and enterhinal grid cell findings in, in uh, rodents. And one could even argue that if you, even if you go as far back as heavy and learning and neural networks, that was um, sort of loosely inspired by um, biology as well. And the second point I think is often overlooked is um, validation testing. So you could have an argument with an engineer um, about you know, a specific favorite algorithm of yours. So let's say it's uh, you know, reinforcement learning. So one could argue, is this, a good, is this gonna be an important component for uh, an, an AGI system at the, in, in the final sort of tally? And you know, one can put forward arguments for yes and for no, but actually if we look into the brain and we find that that algorithm um, is, is implemented uh, in the brain, then we can certainly make the case that it could be a viable, a sensible component for an AGI system. So the, the classic um, kind of example of this was the finding in, in the late 90s that reinforcement learning and, t and temporal difference learning um, were ubiquitously implemented by the brain through the dopamine system. So it does, for example, seem like that reinforcement learning is a general tool we could use as part of an AGI system. And the kind of question I, I sort of often argue with people who, who are against the systems neuroscience approach is, um, you know, how can it not be of net benefit to add the systems neuroscience knowledge into the mix for our quest towards AGI? And just to be clear, I'm not saying, um, you know, we should, we should only use neuroscience or use neuro neuroscience as the primary lead. What, what I'm advocating is actually a hybrid approach where we can try and combine the best of machine learning with the best of neuroscience. And I can really sort of boil this down to sort of two points. Where we know how to build a component already that will be useful for AGI, we just use the latest state-of-the-art uh, art algorithm. So be that reinforcement learning, Monte Carlo techniques, or hierarchical neural networks, all of which seem to be um, you know, useful general algorithms. And it where, it's where we don't know how to build a component at the moment, and I'll give some examples of this um, shortly, that we should do two things. Continue to push pure machine learning approaches hard, um, but in parallel, also look to systems neuroscience um, for the solutions and drive these forwards together. So what does a systems neuroscience procedure as related to AGI look like? Well, it has, it basically, step one is to extract principles behind an algorithm the brain uses. Step two is creatively re-implement that in a computational model, not slavishly copying the way the brain does it. And the result should be, if we're lucky, a state-of-the-art technique and a possible AGI component. So, so far, um, you know, I've argued that uh, neuroscience is an important role to play, but going towards the second part of, of my talk, what you know, might we expect sensible interim goals towards AGI to look like? So some intermediate goals that I've seen proposed by some um, people, um, and, and a lot of people, a lot of efforts going into the moment, is um, on the robotic side. So the idea that to make progress with AGI, we need to have full embodied physical, you know, robots in the physical world. And, you know, a lot of money's been, a lot of research has been spent in this area, um, for example, Honda, you know, has a, a dedicated research team on this that spends, I think, has a budget of in the tens of millions of dollars a year um, for, for robotics. And they produce, you know, impressive um, robots in terms of their physicality. But really, what we're talking about is hugely complex engineering problems of movement, servo motors, and, and mechanical engineering problems um, that I think are actually, you know, very difficult to solve in their own right and slightly distracting if your main interest is actually intelligence. Another quite common um, interim goal that uh, 
you know, I've seen a lot and some researchers are pursuing is what's sort of been termed toddler AGI. And uh, really what we mean by that is AI control and some kind of AI controlled robot that displays qualitatively similar cognitive behaviors to a three year old. And um, actually from the video that Ben already showed, you know, this morning, you know, eight months old um, babies are already extremely able, um, let alone three year olds. So what I would say about this is, you know, and, and part of this definition is what they're really talking about, advocates of this as an interim goal, is a cut down human, um, you know, with perception, actuation, linguistics, communication, social interaction, problem solving, imagination, all the things three year olds do, right, effortlessly. But, you know, that's a massive breadth of capabilities required, right? And that equals an extremely hard problem, tough problem. So if I can pictorially represent this again, if we, in this scale here, if on the, if on the left hand side, we talk about where we are today with AI, and then on the right hand side is kind of like, you know, our final goal, human level AGI, then I would put toddler AGI somewhere way over here on, you know, nip, you know, if there's tw let's say there's 20 key breakthroughs or steps towards human level AGI, toddler AGI would be like step 18, something like that in my mind. And really what I think would be more useful as an intermediate goal would be somewhere way back over there. Um, so what kinds of things, you know, might that be? And I spent quite a lot of time, especially over the last couple of years, thinking about um, what we can really boil down as, as being core or basic capabilities that we'd want an AGI to have that some of these more complex things would, could be built on top of. And so I have this diagram here to just sort of represent that. Um, and if we think of human level AGI as the entire circle and everything in it, um, then what I'm proposing as being core is this kind of section here in, in, in yellow. And what I feel that um, most current and past AGI projects have, um, have focused on are really some of these peripheral things. So I don't know if you can read them with this typeface, but um, there's, there's language here, so linguistics, um, logic systems, um, and embodiment. So what I'm meaning there is actually robotics. And a lot of um, AGI projects actually focus on these, what I would call more peripheral areas, um, as the key part of their project. And I think there are more fundamental things that need to be solved and are probably blocking us from making serious progress. And some of these relate to, to again, what Ben was talking about earlier on today. So I've split this into two main um, core areas that I think are, th are things that we should be doing first. So uh, difficult things that we should be trying to, to crack first. So one is um, conceptual knowledge acquisition and representation. Um, and I'll come uh, back to the definition of exactly what I mean by, that, by conceptual knowledge in a second. But abstract knowledge, um, so beyond just perceptual knowledge. And then if you, if you have that kind of knowledge, then the ability to plan with that knowledge um, at, in order to achieve some kind of goal. Now, in order to do planning properly, well, the reason I've lumped in prediction there is in order to plan properly in a real environment, you need to be able to predict accurately how that environment or opponent um, is going to react to your plans so you can adjust your plans correctly. So these two, these two things here, and these may be two, there may be other ones you can think of, but these two, I think, are more core than, say, language um, or robotics or logic to the, to the intelligence problem. So um, my belief is actually one of the big blockers uh, is, 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 is this idea of conceptual knowledge. So let me try and be a bit more clear about what I mean by that. So knowledge in the brain, so taking some inspiration again from neuroscience, has really been talked about broadly speaking, as, as three kind of levels. And, and these are not discrete, they're kind of fuzzy and they blow into each other. But at the, um, at the, at the bottom level, we have um, perceptual information. So that's the sensory stream, all, this, all the information that comes in through our sensors. Um, and then um, the next level above is what I'm calling conceptual. So this is now when information has been slightly abstracted. So if we give a concrete example, perceptual might be what a dog looks like, um, physically what it looks like, um, but conceptual information about a dog might be things like it's, it's a mammal, makes a good companion, it's good for guarding things, things like that. So these are con that, that's the conceptual level um, uh, uh, understanding of what a dog is. And then finally there's a symbolic level where we're talking about the symbol or the word dog. So there are three kind of levels in, this, in, in the brain and if we now look at where we are on the machine learning side or the AI side, we have quite good ideas of how to do um, two of these levels. 
So on the perceptual side, so dealing with the sensory stream, we actually have a number of um, algorithms and, and systems that can deal reasonably well, not as good as human yet, but reasonably well with distinguishing, say, dogs from cats. So there's deep belief networks, um, Jeffrey Hinton's deep belief networks, there's hierarchical, uh, there's uh, HMAX from Podio, and there's, um, and, and, and there's uh, Jeff, Jeff Hawkins' work on HTNs. And they're all really based around um, hierarchical neural networks. And they deal quite well with perceptual information. And then at the top level, you know, we've had sort of 30, 40 years worth of research on symbolic systems. And we know pretty well how to do, you know, handle symbolic systems and logic networks, probabilistic logic networks and so forth. But what we're really missing is this kind of chasm in between. And if we could solve this chasm, this missing part that corresponds to the conceptual knowledge level in the brain, um, then we could solve kind of two of the most pressing problems there are in AI one of which is the symbol grounding problem. We could ground our symbols in the logic networks in, in, in real concepts. Um, and also this issue of how do we get past just perceptual information and abstract that to something that isn't directly tied to the, to the sensory inputs and the, and the percepts, which is something that none of these systems, although they can handle the percepts, can reach. So none of them so far have been able to generate abstract information um, uh, abstracted away from the actual percepts themselves. So interestingly, on, on the neuroscience side, um, we actually have quite a good candidate for um, uh, how the brain does this so, um, and how the brain creates conceptual knowledge. So it seems like there's a lot of gathering evidence and there's, there's more evidence that needs to be, um, more research that needs to be done, but there's a lot of converging evidence um, suggesting that this conceptual level, um, uh, uh, conceptual information, or you can call it semantic information, um, is basically constructed in the brain by the, the interaction between the hippocampus, which is here in blue, um, and higher level cortex. So association and prefrontal cortex. So association cortex is, is generally here in temporal cortex and prefrontal towards the front. Now, the hippocampus is actually, just anatomically speaking, is extremely good candidate for doing this kind of uh, work because it actually sits on the top of the sensory streams. So um, audio from your, from your hearing, uh, smell and touch and um, vision all converge at the top levels once they've been processed a lot um, to, in the, to, at the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is in a kind of privileged position as far as sensory information goes to sort of tie all the multimodal sensors together. And indeed, that's what it seems to do. Now, so what the hippocampus is known to do already is that it's without your hippocampus, um, you're basically amnesic. So the hippocampus is critical for storing multimodal memories of your recent experiences or, or things you've done. So without your hippocampus, you basically have no memories. Um, what also seems to be very clear now is that during sleep, um, and actually not just during sleep, but also quiet moments of being awake, um, the hippocampus actually replays those memories, reactivates them and replays them. And during sleep, not only is the hippocampus replaying these memories, it's replaying them at orders of magnitude faster than they happen to you in real life. So up to 100 times faster. So what does this suggest? To, what does this immediately suggest to a computer scientist? Well, this is an interesting if you're thinking about high level neocortex, like your prefrontal cortex, learning higher order rules, um, more abstract information, then this seems like a very good teaching signal or very good source of samples for high level neocortex to learn from. So furthermore, what's, you know, this, this whole replay system, which is called consolidation, um, is, is understood, it has some other benefits too. So memories are sort of uh, stochastically selected for replay. Um, and rewarded emotional or otherwise salient memories um, tend to get replayed, selected for replay more often um, than mundane memories, which is exactly what you'd want for, for this kind of system. So what this allows the system to do compared to sensory cortex is that sensory cortex you can think of as building up statistics of the world, right? So, you know, your vision is building up uh, generalities about what it sees in the world. But what we'd like higher order system to do is actually to be able to circumvent that and actually emphasize something important that may have happened to you, but may have only happened very rarely to you, but nonetheless is vital to your survival. <laughs> so that seems to be a clear advantage of a system like this in that it can kind of wait 
the rewarded emotional, otherwise important memories more heavily than run-of-the-mill memories. And then the hypothesis is, and this is still um, work in progress, is that this could then lead to abstraction and um, uh, abstract and, and semantic knowledge. For example, you know, um, uh, the, the, the semantic knowledge about the dog. Okay, so if we have that kind, of, um, that kind of system, what sort of milestones, concrete milestones and abilities might we um, see coming online? So I'll give you several examples. There's plenty you could think of yourselves and, and, and kind of um, you know, add to this. But these are some of the kinds of things that I don't think are possible to do today, but maybe possible um, you know, in the next few years in the sort of shortish term in terms of research time cycles. So um, this is why I'm turning abstract classification. There's probably a better name for it. But the example I give for this is imagine you're training a vision system to, and what you want your vision system to do is to recognize um, empty and full containers. So the difference between a container or a cup, let's say, that's empty or that's full. Now, the traditional way you would go about training a support vector machine or any one of these kind of um, standard classification techniques is you'd get a bunch of examples of both. So let's say we had a thousand um, examples of containers, different containers with, that were full with different liquids and a thousand containers, different ones again, that were all empty. And you feed them in as training data to your classification system. And then how you test it is you present it with a, a novel container, a new container, and you ask the system, is this container empty or full? Now, interestingly, the answer is clearly in the percepts. It's, it's, the, the answer is, you know, it's, it's, it's in the input pixels or however you're inputting the picture. And yet, um, somehow, it's a slightly abstract piece of information. So it's, it's, it's not as simple as sort of detecting, say, the color or the, or the shape um, of an object. There's some kind of abstract element in there. And, and actually, it turns out that none of the current state-of-the-art systems, so HMACs, DBNs, can do this kind of classification task. And the reason I picked something like MT4, there's loads you could obviously pick that are more abstract than that, is that um, that seems to be on the cusp, the boundary between perceptual knowledge and conceptual knowledge. So I could, I could speculate, and there's not really enough time for me to go into why I think this is a problem. Um, I think there's two issues I can quickly go through that, that need to be tackled. One is the idea of building knowledge on top of other knowledge. That's something that hardly anyone has really tried to do or tackled very well. So it seems like probably the reason that these classification systems would have difficulty in doing this empty full kind of classification is that really before they are trained on this, they need to know things like what a solid is and a liquid. Um, you know, what a container is, these kinds of issues. So probably um, it's, too, it's sort of too high level already. The second thing is actually this, what I would call the symbol grounding problem rearing its head again, in that if you label this training data as empty and full, um, what is it in, within those data sets and those pictures of, of empty and full containers are you actually labeling? You know, which pixels are you labeling? Which, which parts of that image are you, are you referring to? And of course, the, the classification system has no idea. So um, here's another example of uh, uh, sorts of things we might be able to do if we, if we could deal with this conceptual knowledge problem, discovery of higher order structure. So take this number sequence, um, which is famous number sequence, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. And let's imagine you got this in as a number stream, um, number, single digit by single digit. What is the next number? Well, it's obviously four, right? Because you can see the underlying clear, obvious underlying structure here of ascending numbers. The interesting thing about this number series is if you take it out to the limit, um, say a million digits, um, actually, whatever, whatever statistical learning technique you use, which is, relates to sort of Moshe's argument, however much data you, I give you on this number sequence, I could give you infinite, num infinite uh, data on this sequence, you will not be able to predict what the next number is because um, the actual chance of one number following another is uniform. So the chance of a four following a one is the same as it following a two, three, four, and so on, um, out to the limit. So it doesn't matter how much data you have, you can't actually solve this problem, which is obviously a trivial problem. So, um, so that's interesting. So statistical learning doesn't seem to be enough, or data on its own doesn't seem to be enough. Um, impressive though, you know, results though it gets, um, as Moshe has already discussed and Google already shown. Um, then there's, then there's ideas of you know, algorithms that can build sophisticated models of their environment. 
So one kind of an interim milestone I sort of dream about and uh, uh, thinking about is that which would be, you know, I think would show clear progress in this area is um, some kind of um, algorithm or computer uh, program that can just through observing through a raw video stream of a card table with two humans playing a card game, uh, infer what the rules of the card game are and be able to beat those humans, say, after uh, uh, 24 hours worth of video. Um, it, including if the, the, the humans just invent any game ad hoc on the spot, obviously as long as it's um, a coherent game. So it's that kind of ability, I think, that um, is missing from you know, what we're able to do today. And then another example is in, in psychology, what's called transfer learning. So there's, there's tons of examples of psychological experiments that test this. Um, it's a massively important feature, I think, of intelligence, um, where basically we learn a response to, in, in, in a rewarding response, let's say, in one perceptual context. We abstract the, the underlying rules behind why that worked. And then what that allows us to do is apply it correctly in a completely new perceptual context, one that looks completely different from the context we learned the initial response in. Of course, actually, so these are interim goals that I would be looking out for or, or I suggest we should be working towards. And, um, but there are already some impressive things that have already happened that actually once this, I think this is a, a kind of um, a curse of the AI field that once impressive things get done, people sort of are quite blasé about them. But for example, um, Mogo was the first program just last year, actually two years ago now, first program to be a professional um, human player at Go which after Deep Blue um, beat Kasparov in the late 90s was thought to be the new Holy Grail. And it, and it did it with um, Monte Carlo techniques that didn't involve a lot of special case programming. And then, of course, just like uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, there's IBM's Watson that took on some human champions at Jeopardy, um, at, which is obviously uh, from the non-Americans uh, in the audience is, is, a, is, a qu is a big quiz show in the US and um, has a lot of riddles, there's questions, and it's, it's actually a very complicated problem. And um, in an exhibition map, uh, match, they, they, they beat two of the human world champions. So there's already some quite impressive things um, going on. Now, sort of related to this is um, how do we uh, measure progress towards either these interim goals and, over to, uh, and towards the overall goal? So I think there's two approaches to this, sensible approaches. One approach is to sort of ad hoc um, measure success across um, a, a sort of fairly ad hoc suite of tasks um, and try and hope that you pick a range of tasks that, that test general capabilities rather than specific capabilities. Obviously, that's quite difficult to do um, and it's quite difficult to make sure that, that, that someone can't cheat with an algorithm and special case it for each specific task. What we better um, was ideally what we'd like is a more integrated principle measure of progress and something that's capable of producing a graph like this where we have year and we have algorithms tested on this, on this, on this um, measure and they basically we, we hopefully find a nice um, you know, increase in performance. That's what we'd ideally like. Um, we're not there yet, although a colleague of mine at the Gatsby is working hard on this Shane Legg um, and actually has created uh, with, with Joel Vaness uh, this idea of algorithmic IQ so testing the IQ of an algorithm, and they've tested it with um, a Monte Carlo approximation to the universal AI machine that Marcus Hutter um, invented that Jürgen talked about yesterday, this, this, this machine called, a, this algorithm called AIXE, and that's, in, that's not a tractable algorithm, but um, you can approximate it with Monte Carlo techniques. And what this graph shows is, is the amount of resources you allow the Monte Carlo technique to use um, in terms of context depth, and then how well it does on a 10,000 randomly sampled um, computational environments. And you can see um, this system orders, uh, uh, orders these agents in a sensible way. So this looks very promising, and, and there's still more to be done on this. So finally, I'll just end um, with the theme of the, of the conference, which is um, just a few predictions. So it's my prediction, actually, that I think it, when, we, when we come to look back on how AGI was kind of cracked, hopefully we get there, um, we'll find that systems neuroscience understanding um, will have played a, a part in inspiring solutions to probably more than one key component of the overall puzzle. Um, I expect we'll, we'll see in the next sort of five years some systems with some kind of transfer learning and conceptual knowledge acquisition capabilities. I think our measurement tools will get better 
And with that kind of progress, actually, may open up whole new avenues of doing research. So if we have a good way of specifying, um, fine-grained way of specifying um, improvement, then that opens up um, abilities maybe to use things like hill climbing algorithms to improve our um, AI techniques. And I think uh, sort of once these, some of these interim goals um, have been achieved, like transfer learning, conceptual knowledge, understanding, we will have a better understanding of the overall goal of AGI and possibly um, have more data to, to, to deal with the safety issues that, that several other speakers have talked about. Um, and I think that, you know, the overall AGI is, is, is probably, um, you know, 20 plus years away um, for human level AGI. But I think that um, these interim milestones will show concrete progress towards that and also be maybe be useful as applications in their own right on the way. Thanks for listening. <laughs>